Welcome to Sam's Business Growth Show. I'm Sam Dunning, a digital marketing, sales, and business growth evangelist. Tune in and subscribe today as I'll be interviewing business leaders, experts, and entrepreneurs from around the globe. You'll be learning their story, how digital marketing has helped them along the way, and exclusive tips and insights to help you skyrocket your own business. And welcome back to the show. I'm excited to be joined today by Kieran O'Connor. Kieran is the co-founder at Growthstream, who have generated over 10 million in addition revenue over 18 months for their clients. He's gone from sales executive to commercial director and in six short years. He's headed up an international expansion at the age of just 22. He won Rising Star of the Year Award back in 2019 and he's generated over 1.8 million in sales by just the age of 19. He's lived in all, all over the world really, Orlando, Austin, Texas and Uruguay and he's been part of building over 20 plus industry leading sales team. Kieran, a warm welcome to the show my friend, how are you doing? Great, great to be here, Sam. Thanks very much for the introduction. It makes me sound uh, probably a lot better than I am. But uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Glad to be here uh, on this amazing sunny day. So yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, man. Beautiful day outside, but even yeah. better inside tuning into the podcast or watching it from your home indeed. Cool. Absolutely. Excited to chat, my friend. So as always, there's, there's a few things we want to learn from you, good self, Kieran. We want to learn your story, um, how you got into the business world and how you got to where you are today. We want to learn your top business growth strategies and we want to know some of the digital marketing channels that you've had success with and that you recommend for everyone tuning in today. So before we get to those interesting and juicy parts, let's find out a bit more about yourself, where you grew up, how you got into the business world and some of the key places you've worked at and lessons learned up to now, my friend. Yeah, it's a very interesting story and a story that I haven't told very often. So um, I'm looking forward to sharing it with you today. So um, for those of you who are listening, you know, I grew up in a place called Norfolk. Um, not many people uh, know where that is, you know, for reference, that's kind of Norwich, East Anglia, uh, in a small place called Bungie. And, you know, I went to school there and, and grew up there for sort of 10 years for, for most of my sort of uh, junior years. And kind of went to school as, as typical, you know, went through high school. And uh, I guess the biggest part of, of that early days was I wasn't academic. Um, I wasn't very smart when it came to a classroom. Um, as mentioned previously, you know, I suffered massively with dyslexia. Um, I was always kind of seen as this naughty kid, um, the kid that wasn't really going to achieve much and um, was told that on a daily basis uh, by both sort of teachers and students alike. So, it, you know, it's certainly a tough upbringing initially and kind of a shock to the system when you are put down on a daily basis uh, for, you know, having this lecture and not actually um, taught in the way that, you know, aligns with dyslexia. So it is a, a certainly tough journey um, growing up in a place like that, very quiet, but also the support network wasn't there. So um, it was certainly an interesting start. You know, I became sort of very shy around, um, you know, wanting to write, you know, when it came to writing assignments or going up to the whiteboard and, you know, putting your thoughts and answers, I'd be very much the guy at the back of the room, um, not wanting to do that because I was too afraid of people obviously uh, taking the mic and um, people realizing that I wasn't very good at spelling and grammar. So it was a uh, Certainly a, a tough start. Um, at the age of sort of 16, when we left school, it was kind of between 15 and 16 where it really changed for me. Um, I can't tell you why, just something in my brain that really kind of resonated with me to sort of say, you know what, doesn't matter what people say, you can do this. Um, as we all know, when you take GCSEs, you're given predicted grades. Uh, my predicted grades were very much uh, F, E's, U's. They were, they were just, it's pointless, basically. So um, I spent a year on really adapting my learning, you know, doing practice test after practice test after practice test, staying behind our school and really proving people wrong. Now, again, I wasn't a genius. I didn't pass with A's, but I got C's and B's, considering what I was predicted was a massive achievement for me. So, um, you know, it's certainly an interesting start in, the, in terms of the school world and the whole dyslexia and uh, being put down. Um, at that age, I then had a decision, really. You know, all of my friends and people that I knew were going to university, and I already knew that, you know, the classroom wasn't for me. Um, and I got actually offered my first job in insurance, which was uh, a company called Swinton, um, where ultimately sure. they took inbound calls via GoCompare and all the different platforms. Um, and your job was to upsell, cross-sell, um, and engage with the prospect and try and find referrals. And um, that was my first job into sales. And just something resonated. It, you know, it was amazing. It was an amazing first job, um, done really well. Um, the call center was open from sort of 8 a.m. all the way down to sort of 10 p.m. And I quickly realized that actually the harder I worked, the more I learned, 
I could make all this money. And the paycheck that I was taking at home quite early on in sort of 17 years old, 18 years old was amazing and facilitated me buying nice cars. And um, yeah, that was really what got me the bug of sales, really. Um, so that was I, where you got a taste for it, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that whole, you know, not having to work for an hourly rate and you could earn as much as you want, depending on how much you put in. And it was something that was like, wow, this is amazing. And found myself really good on the phone and being able to engage with people really well. And um, I lost that fear of writing, you know, I lost that fear of, oh, do I say it? Do I go up to this? And it really resonated with me. I, I can't tell you what it was. Um, it was amazing. Quickly become a top performer there. Uh, and just loved it. You know, I wanted to work every day, uh, you know, weekends, bank holidays. I just wanted to work. Um, and the paychecks came rolling in. So, yeah, that was kind of the early days. Um, Is there anything you could share with us before we move to, to the next venture for yourself, Kieran? Anything you could share with us in terms of how you became a top performer? appreciate this is where you kind of found your love for sales. You realized that it was, it was a passion yeah, of yeah. yours. Um, was, it, was it from your colleagues or were you reading books? What were you doing to, to make yourself stand out and get to the top in terms of hitting targets and making commissions? Um, it sounds a bit crazy, but the, the best thing I ever done and something going against the kind of typical grain was move out. I moved out at 17 years old. It was the best thing I've ever done. Um, it makes you responsible. It makes you responsible for your bills. You have bills to pay. You need to hit commission. You need to make sure you're at the top of that leaderboard every month. So that was kind of step number one. It's something that I advocate all the time. And I know again, it goes against the grain of kind of stay at home, save for your first mortgage. For me, it didn't work like that. You know, the best thing I ever done was move out and really push myself to that next level. Um, the second thing was work ethic. You know, I was so driven to prove these people that doubted me for these sort of 16, 17 years that I was good. I was capable and I could do it. And then self-development, you know, I looked at the top of the leaderboard, I looked at what they were doing, I would ask for their time, I would ask for their feedback, I'd ask for my calls to be listened to, um, and then it came to sort of books and um, YouTube videos and um, uh, events, expos, just anywhere that I could learn from people, I was just soaking it up as much as possible, and um, the biggest thing that I guess at a young age that really differentiated myself was I wasn't looking forward to the weekend. The weekend for me was a chance that um, I wasn't able to work as much, wasn't able to earn as much money. So, you know, the typical teenager looked forward to the weekend, getting drunk, going out with their mates. I was very much learn, 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 grow, grow, grow. So, yeah, the two, the two biggest ones for me was push yourself, uh, self-develop, look at the, what people are doing, um, and ask, don't be afraid to ask for their help. And um, I guess the controversial one is uh, move out as soon as possible. That, for me, it, it was massive. Love that. Awesome, man. Okay. So insurance was the first game. That's where you dipped your feet in the sales world and started loving it. Started <laughs> progressing quite nicely. What, what was next, my friend? Yeah. So I started looking at the opportunities in the area. Being from Norwich, there wasn't a massive opportunity um, like there is in London. So um, there's a company called Epos now, which were uh, electronic point of sale, a very early startup. And I'd heard great things. You know, the owner was doing amazing things in the space of the software as a service. Um, and so I went for an interview through, through a recruiter and they kind of offered me a job at 16,000 base salary, which was, was obviously a massive shock from going from a high performer earning loads of commission to, uh, are you willing to take 16,000? And this kind of brings me to my next point of where I think I've done really well and where I was smart was I look for opportunity, not money. And a lot of people just look for the high end paying jobs. Um, I look for opportunity. Uh, so I took that role um, and they kind of had two teams, one team job was to call all of the old leads, to call um, the new leads that came in, to call all the ones that haven't got back to us, and book online demonstrations for the sales team. So I started at the bottom, um, done that for three months, you know, 100, 200 calls, booking appointments, very little commission, um, and actually uh, my bills were higher than my wage, uh, in essence. So I was going to work for free in a way, but I looked for the opportunity. Uh, within three months, I was, you know, I was top, and they basically had promoted me to sales. Um, and then how it worked to that business is you could hit a ratchet every quarter to get a pay rise on your base salary and then your relevant commission. I was the first one ever in that business to hit four back-to-back -back quarters. Um, my first quarter in sales in that um, arena to get a pay rise every quarter and ended up doing over a million in sales for that organization. Became number one on a regular basis. Um, and then at the age of 20, was given the opportunity to, to go to Orlando and be part of the, uh, the U.S. expansion. So Awesome, man. What an experience. Um, so how did you, you said when you were on the appointment setting stage, so when you're booking demos, booking appointments for the sales reps, you were actually earning less than, than what you needed. So how, how did you keep yourself motivated to, to keep pushing through to think, oh, I've got to stick this out 
is eventually something good will come if I can prove myself. Yeah, well, I have to hand a lot of credit to the business owners at Epos now and the, the staff there. You know, I could see what they were achieving. You know, Jason Heavens, people who don't know him, is a very, very accomplished businessman at a young age. Um, and if I'm honest with you, you know, I was looking at that and going, you know, if I can keep learning from these guys, keep learning, just don't worry about the money. You're still young. You haven't got any children. You can still still make this happen. And for me, it was just that that hunger of seeing my progression at a young age and actually you know, being honest, seeing, uh, proving the doubt was wrong, you know, um, people told me I was crazy, you know, why would I work for 16,000, and to kind of put it into perspective, um, I lived in a place back then, I went back home for a brief couple of months, um, while I was in between apartments, and I had to go from uh, Ditchton where I live, which was an hour's bus journey into Norwich City Centre, and then walk a further sort of half an hour to 45 minutes just to get to work, so I was waking up at sort of 4, 5 a.m. and not getting home to kind of 11 p.m., um, sometimes 12 p.m., um, f- basically working for free. So it, it shows that you have to sacrifice. And I think the biggest problem in today's society is there are a lot of entitlement and a lot of people just look at who's paying the highest money, I'll take that job. And, um, you know, I think I was very smart there to say, you know what, I'm going to look for the opportunity. I'm going to learn from the best. I'm going to take as much as I can in. And uh, it paid off, you know, luckily. Love it. <laughs> no, that's, that's a really good statement. You made there look for opportunity, not money. And the fact that not everything's walk in the park. And if you do want to get somewhere, I, I'm on exactly the same boat. You, you, I agree that you have to sacrifice. And I wish I had your ambition for sales when I was, I was the age you were. It wasn't until I got into kind of mid to late 20s that I started actually thinking about it and ramping things up on my end. So that's awesome, dude. Okay, so then you've got the opportunity to go overseas to Orlando. How was that? Look, again, an amazing opportunity. And again, I always like to give thanks to the people that put me here. You know, these guys put a massive faith in me at the age of 20. And so to give you a bit of a background, I took two weeks off um, before going to America. And I said, you know what? I'm going to become an expert. Um, I'm going to learn every competitor in the market. I'm going to learn how they sell. I'm going to listen to calls that are already happening over there. Um, I'm going to stay in the office and do the UK hours and then swap and do the US hours. Um, And on day one, I can then hit the ground running and I don't have to worry about a ramp up time. So that's what I did. You know, I've done demonstrations of all the competition. I learned the market. I learned how they sell over there because it's very different to the, to the UK. Um, where the leads came from, I asked the VP of sales to send me recordings and just immersed myself in that world before I even touched down or even got on that flight. So month one, I became the top sales guy with over $50,000 in sales in month one with never been or ever stepped foot in the US before. Amazing, man. Okay. No, so it sounds like you just did as much research as possible. And like you said, really immerse yourself in it. And um, yeah, had, had great results. Cool. Okay. So you did that for a little while. And um, what, what was the next venture for yourself? How long did that go on for? And what was, what was kind of yeah, the next step? So sort of, I think that, you know, I left there around sort of 21. Um, and, you know, I didn't want to go back to sleepy Norwich. No disrespect to Norwich, but I thought, um, and I was always told, look, the best sales guys are in London. And I was like, well, if the best are in London, I want to be amongst the best. And um, if I'm honest with you, I was like, can I, can I um, compete amongst the best? Um, so I actually got headhunted for a job in London for a similar product. Again, electronic point of sale, but more on the iPads. So when okay. people come and serve you in a restaurant, it's the software behind that. Very new company, sort of four or five staff, um, offered me sales management role. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to do it. And I actually just packed up and uh, rented an Airbnb. I uh, didn't even get a leash or anything. Just put my stuff in a suitcase and went. Um, so went there at the age of, you know, I was sort of 21, 22. And... Um, yeah, you know, from there it's kind of like, right, um, build it from the ground up. You know, I had to bring leads. I had to bring the sales team, the training, the sales methodology, the scripts, the objection handling, and basically build the, the business from the ground up. Um, and within six months, you know, we'd got a team of eight people. We were one of the fastest growing tech companies in that space. We'd got one of the highest performing teams in that space. Um, and I'd hired all my staff from, from with no sales experience. So, it, it was a massive journey for me, a massive learning curve. Um, pushed myself again out of my comfort zone. I knew no one in London. Um, I'd never been a sales manager previously, um, although I'd got experience, very little. Um, and again, coming back to what I've done throughout my career, is just learn, learn as much as possible, found the people that had the answers, um, asked for feedback consistently uh, on a regular basis. Um, and yeah, it quickly turned that into one of the fastest growing sales teams there was in that industry. Um, and then along came another opportunity where they came and said, you know, fancy an opportunity to go global again. So was um, promoted to commercial director and was tasked with going to expand the U.S. operation. Um, 
So I went over there with one of the directors for, for a week, um, scouted the American market, where the best cities were, where the fastest growing um, industries were, the, the wages, the living costs, everything you can think of. Um, and then decided on Austin, Texas, um, which if you haven't been, is an incredible city. Um, so yeah, headed over there at sort of 22 and um, expanded the business into to America, which was an amazing experience at such a young age. Um, having that role of commercial director at you know 22 was um, such a weight to have on your shoulders. But um, again, I just looked at how could I be the best? What could I learn? Uh, and immerse myself and turned it into one of the fastest growing companies in Austin. Um, done amazingly amazing, well. Um, so yeah, it was uh, amazing. You know, amazing. Sounds like yeah, it sounds like quite a roller coaster you had in terms of progress. But the thing that seems to keep running true is that. Like you say, you immersed yourself, you learned from everyone around you and tried to, to soak up as much as you could to, to really do your research and understand how to attack things before going into it. Um, okay, really interesting, man. So Austin, Texas, how long did that go on for? And then was it starting up um, Grove Stream after this? Or? Yeah, absolutely. So it didn't go on for, you know, we were there for sort of six, seven months because we had some visa issues, if I'm honest. Okay. Um, so the government made relevant changes and there were some issues around the visa side of things. So um, we've done amazingly well um, from going from no sales to over sort of 70 sales a month plus uh, within sort of month two, month three, and it just kept on climbing. You know, we were doing amazingly well. Uh, we were getting some great accolades out there. People were watching us and um, it was amazing. But at the time where we had this visa issue, um, I started to look at whether I could manage these teams remotely from a different time zone. Uh, and at that point, you know, given my, um, I guess the, the wanting to win all the time and the ability to give my ultimate all, I felt, and I said to the business, look, you know, you need someone on the ground in America. You need someone who's going to be there all the time. And I don't want to impact the business by trying to manage the operation remotely. So at that time, you know, I started to, to take a look at what, what was next. You know, I had a bit of a roller coaster career up until now, you know, still only 22. Um, it'd been an amazing journey. All, to, all of these countries, Austin, Texas, Uruguay, Orlando, London, Norwich, um, kind of done it all. So I started to take a step back on why could I consistently build so many successful sales teams at such a short um, span of time. Um, and we all go there, you know, maybe it's because I work hard than everyone else, maybe because I've got this innate uh, skill. And actually, it came down to the fact that I got the foundations right. You know, I was, I was a stickler for foundations, um, making sure I build on the right foundations. As, if you want to use this sort of uh, corny term, you wouldn't build a house without foundations. And that was my philosophy. Um, if I got the right foundations, I knew how to build on top of that and, and bring the right people in and train them in the right way. Uh, to, to create an industry leading sales team at a rapid rate. So, um, to answer your question, you know, I went to Uruguay for a short period of sort of three months to look at their development team, learn more of the development side, help them out on that side of the business, and, and just really bring the business together. Um, and, and like I said, you know, me and my business partner, Costa Koizzi, who you'll see online as well, you know, we, we sat down, we like, you know, we, we've done amazing things and, and we started to formalize this process, uh, which we now call the, the four pillar process. And we were like, if we could execute this in hundreds of businesses across the world, this could be amazing. And, and really that started my obsession with bringing what I knew to hundreds of businesses across the UK. And it's a funny story because we made that decision while we're in Uruguay and yeah. we left Uruguay and it was, sort of, you know, it was sort of a 24 hour journey. If you take into consideration all the time zones and everything. And we actually signed a, a lease on a rented property in London without even seeing it. Um, we were like, yep, that will do. We'll be back in a, you know, in a week's time. Um, packed our suitcase in Uruguay and landed to an empty apartment having been up for you know, nearly 24 hours and um, no beds, no sofas, no nothing, just our, just our laptops and our suitcases and, and got to work on the business. You know, we were like, how can we bring this, um, this formalized process to as many businesses as possible? It, it started our obsession, you know. Um, so that so you basically cut, started a company in 24 hours, it sounds like. Yeah, basically, you know, basically, <laughs> awesome. you know, um, we've, we've basically no money. Uh, we had about £3,000 between us. Um, we've got an empty apartment, um, we've got no real savings. Um, and we were like, you know what, if we can bring this, this formalized process to hundreds of businesses, we know, um, businesses will see the results that we have seen over the, the span of our career. So, um, yeah, we, we did that in September, 2018. And to date we've done 10 million in additional revenue, um, sort of backtracking a little bit. We started the company under O'Connor Global Consultancy. So, you know, I'll just use my name. That'll do. Uh, let's get a, a free logo design. And um, 
let's start making cold calls and, and tell people about what we offer and signed our first client uh, on a cold call I think about a month in sort of three four weeks in uh, which was our first big break I guess and um, from there it's just built and built and built and you know we then founded Growstream because we wanted a name that resonated with our vision um, created the new website and, and started taking on more and more clients and yeah it's been a certainly a amazing journey over the last 18 months um, incredible story man really interesting to learn um, all, all the positions you've been in and your, your quick growth and, and you're only 24 years old now so that's amazing um, yeah. okay so starting a company in 24 hours cold calling get signing up your first <laughs> client from, a, from an apartment that's awesome and um, how did it go from there how have you been able so that was back in 2018 what, talk us through some of the strategies, Kieran, that you've, you've used to, to get the growth that you are now. Because I know you've said you've done over 10 million in, in revenue for your, your customers. So tell yeah, us a yeah. bit about some of the strategies that you and your business partner have utilized to, to get, get from kind of cold calling to where you are today and, and, yeah, how you've made it happen. Yeah, so look, at the start, it was certainly challenging. You know, um, I had never really talked about my story and talked about my successes, and I, I kept it very much in my network. Um, which is the first mistake I made because as you all know, you know, personal brand marketing, getting your story out there was, was number one. So to kind of backtrack to talk more about the, the, the process, um, the four pillar process, I guess is the most important thing here um, to formalize that to people listening and, and potentially watching is that consists of structure. So first of all, we're looking at the structure of your day, how you formalize your day to optimize your sales teams and your team. But we all know today biggest problem is, LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, you know, you've got all of these distractions. So we really look at the structure of sales teams and making sure we're optimizing our time um, efficiently. Then we go into the touch point process. Now, a lot of companies that we talk to don't actually have or know what a touch point process is. Ultimately means how many times you touch a lead to get hold of it. So then we look to implement a touch point process over a five, seven, and 10 working day period to make sure we're giving ourselves the best opportunity to get hold of them leads. Then we go into formalizing our follow-up. Uh, you know, industry average last year was, uh, it takes on average five follow-ups to close a deal. And it, it was shocking the amount of companies we were going to that just didn't have a follow-up process. You know, um, it'd be a case of, you know, call me next week. Yeah, yeah, no problem, Kieran. And as we all know, it'd be that hamster wheel, chasing, 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 chasing. Um, and then that kind of led us to the, the fourth part, which was follow back, which we all know is kind of that dreaded, oh no, they've put it on hold, they haven't got the budget, um, probably not going to make a decision for 6, 12, 18 months. And then we start to formalize the process and the uh, follow back process. So they're the four areas that we cover with businesses. Okay, so they sound really basic and, and people are like, but why do companies not already do this? And we're like, you're telling me. <laughs> um, and these four areas, we would go into businesses initially and we would do what we call a sales audit. So we would look at these four areas in a business and start to look at what are they doing? Um, where are the gaps and where can we make money both uh, short term, but also set their foundations up in the right way for long term success. Um, okay. So that's what we do with our clients. You know, we go in, we do an initial sales audit, we work with them. We actually get in amongst their team. We become an extension of their team. You know, we're just as much uh, into their success as they are because we earn, you know, most of our money off the, off the back of their success. So, it was really important for us to be in amongst it and really driving that success um, in a proactive way. So we'd be in their offices, helping them, listening to calls, looking at their CRMs. Um, Love it. So that's okay. what we do with our clients. Um, in terms of what we did as a business, well, first of all, obviously, we went to the industries that we'd, we'd been in and we'd got a name for and target them businesses. So, you know, my biggest one was Epos and my first client was an Epos client. It just made sense. You know, you've got the background, you've got the name in that space, target that space first. And then we sort of um, adapted it from there, utilizing referrals. But actually, for the first sort of 18 months, it was literally referrals and my network. Um, and then clients were keeping us busy five days a week. So we didn't actually, and this is just me being honest, and some, something we made a mistake of is not talking about our story, not doing any social, um, not doing any press releases, not doing any podcasts, not doing any, anything. Uh, it was literally just that. It's great. That's a great point. So that you've raised some really good points. So I really, I really like that four pillar process that you've just gone through there, Kieran. That you follow up for your your customers. So in terms of structure, um, mm -hmm. I think that's that's something certainly I could improve. So I know it's so easy to get distracted, especially when you wake up in the morning. You want to check your emails. You want to check LinkedIn. You might check Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Um, so I'm messing about on my notification for LinkedIn for about 20 minutes when I first wake up, faffing around with that before I even kind of think about what else I've got to do. Um, so in terms of follow-up, I think we've all been guilty of 
having a lead either that we've generated outbound or we've gen that's come inbound and yeah. we try to call it a couple of times perhaps over a couple of days and we forget to put it in the crm or we put it in the crm it goes to the back of the burner and then it's it's basically forgotten about so the opportunity is yeah. pretty much wasted or we remember a week later we give the give the person a call and they've already gone with another vendor and we're like, oh, damn. Well, so have you got any recommendations on creative or ways that work that you can follow up? Yeah, so kind of going back, structure number one. So what we look at in structure um, is we look at, okay, well, when are people picking up the phone in your industry? So it'll be different for different industries, depending on who you're targeting. Um, then it'll be, when is the most talk time happening? When are, when are you getting hold of them? But not only getting hold of them, when are you having them productive phone calls? Um, and then when are the most leads coming in? So we'd really break down three core sections during the day for prospecting, calling them new leads, making sure you're on top of them, making sure you're getting the touch points throughout the day. So you know at the end of the day that you've completed all your, your calls and your touch points, you've completed your time for admin, and you've really nailed it in terms of um, the day, and then anything extra is just uh, anything on top, which is amazing. Um, so that's how we manage our structure. We start to break it into segments. So for example, one company we work with between nine and 11 is their core prospecting hours. Nine and 11 for two hours, you do nothing, but you prospect, you call your leads, you follow up, um, you, you know, you just call. And um, you're exactly right in what you say. A lot of people get distracted with their phones. There's obviously tactics that, you know, you need to imply, you know, put your mobile away, put it on silent, face down. Um, you know, we've even seen people put signs at their desk, kind of leave me alone. <laughs> Um, and if you formalize it though across your team, what you quickly find is everybody's prospecting. So there's no one gossiping or trying to talk to you because everyone's so in the zone, which creates that uh, lack of distraction, but also creates that competitiveness because everybody's at it at the same time. So that's how that really battles that conundrum that you have there. And, um, you know, we're all guilty. You just have to turn off notifications and be disciplined. And I think once you start to see the results of that structure, um, you just you just can't get enough of it. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Of course, you will always have them days where you're like, oh, why didn't I do that? Um, but from a structure process, that's what I'd say. Um, from a follow up process, it's you know, you're on the phone, you've had a meeting, whatever that is, uh, presentation online, phone call, or in person. You need to first isolate the objection around what needs to happen next. You need to agree on that. Um, if you can't close that deal either on the phone or in person. You need to agree and isolate the objection, whether it be I need to talk to my partner, you know, I need to look at finances. Okay, great. Agree on next steps. Then you need to be sending that calendar invite there and then. Get it sent across. Get it sent across and get it accepted while you're either on the phone call, on that demonstration, or in person. It goes into their calendar and they've confirmed it and then follow up with a recap email. So then you're never going to lose track of it. And then the customer is also committed to it. The biggest problem we find is call me next week. What does that mean? When? What time? What about? What's going to change between now and next week? So, um, like you said, really formalizing your processes, making sure it's in the CRM, send that calendar invite, get it accepted, and, um, and build from there. Cool. Love it. Love it. And I really love the, the finalizing next steps. So, like you say, that's a really common thing, isn't it? When you're speaking to a prospect or a lead, oh, I'm busy right now. Can we, can we catch up next week or can we catch up next month? And, and like you say, just finalize the date whilst you're on the phone, get that calendar invite and accept it whilst you're on it. And then at least you've got something booked in. Love it. Okay. Um, just before we move away from that, have you got any yeah. creative ways to, that you found pretty well good in terms of follow-up, Kieran? Because um, I know sometimes, let's say you've got a, a, an inquiry and you can't reach them on the phone. So I know some of our, our guests, and I know myself, have had success perhaps with LinkedIn or video and things like that. Have you got any unusual ways of follow-up that you like to utilize, or is it quite <laughs> traditional stuff you go to? Um, traditional stuff, but video is massive and personalized. You know, the amount of times I see uh, generic, spammy emails sent as a follow-up, oh, hi, thanks for inquiring. Um, give me a call when you've got five minutes. Um, it needs to be personalized. It needs to be specific. Um, and for me, uh, video always works. You know, the great thing is you've got so many different video platforms that can integrate with your CRM and your email tools now from Vidyard to all these different ones. You know, shoot a quick five-minute video, four-minute video, two-minute video, whatever that looks like. You know, hi, Sam. Great. Thanks very much for uh, sending your inquiry for. Da -da 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 -da. Make it specific, why you've called them, and why it's a benefit to them to want to call you back. Um, for me, that's worked massively. Um, because they see that you put the time. Um, I also track and use different tools to track when they open emails and you know, how long they've watched of the videos and things like that, um, so I know. Um, and then of course, you know, you've got to look at all platforms, you know, making sure you've got the right number, checking their website, 
um, LinkedIn. There's different, obviously, different ways that you can do that. But a big one that I found successful is then personalized emails with video. Um, and again, LinkedIn, personalized message, you know, not just, hi, I want to speak to you, give me a call, when's good for you. Um, the amount of times I see that is crazy. Got it. Awesome, man. Okay. So we've talked about the fact that you've utilized existing contacts that you had in, from, from EPOS days to, to generate yeah, business yeah. referrals. Were there any other channels that you've had success with in terms of growth, be it online or be it offline? Yeah, so at the start of the, the business, no. You know, I made that mistake of just kind of assuming that my network would be enough. Um, and kind of it's only really over the last kind of since last November uh, where we start to say, well, look, you know, people resonate with the story. They resonate with the, the process. They understand the importance of the, the foundations. And once we start to get the story out there and show people um, how this process can change their direction of their sales team and really utilize the, the process, uh, it's been massive. So we started things like uh, seminars, you know, going to expo, uh, expos and discussing the four pillar process with people and how they can utilize it in their business. Uh, we started doing the new website, um, Google Ads, um, LinkedIn, sort of, um, you know, we teamed up with some newspapers where they wanted to run our story around sort of, you know, the challenges that we faced from a young age and how we, we came here. So, yeah, just really started to speak about our story rather than just kind of keep it to ourselves. And it's been a massive success and it's helped us to continue the growth of the business up until now because a lot more people are knowing about us. A lot of people are knowing what we do and what we offer. So um, to answer your question, there's been a couple of things, you know, expos, Google ads, Facebook ads, uh, website, new website, obviously aligning with what we offer. Um, and then being a little bit more active on LinkedIn, you know, um, I was very shy suffering with dyslexia. You didn't want to post because, Oh, what if I spell it wrong? What if I look stupid? You know, what if people judge me? Um, so I've kind of tried to get over that fear with, with posting more content and um, yeah, it seems to be working well. And um, you know, we're always looking at new ways that we can get in front of the right audience and offer value. And I guess that's why we started to look at podcasts and things like this. Yeah. I love that, man. Um, and I love that you're, you're utilizing a whole range of channels to, to generate new, new business rather than just homing on one, mm. utilize all, all the channels, which is something I preach about all the time, all the channels that your audience are on, why not be on them too? Um, so if, if your customers on LinkedIn, if your customers searching online, if a customer's clicking on ads, then get there and enjoy more leads. Is, is there one channel that you've had particular success with or are they all fairly even? Yeah, I mean, LinkedIn has always been the biggest for me, you know, um, and referrals, of course. Um, but again, I think we haven't explored every option to the best of our ability. You know, I'm not a marketer. I'm a sales guy. I know how to formalize a sales team when it comes to marketing. We're not you know, we're not the experts. So that's when we rely on other people to kind of point us in the right direction. You know, there's so many things right now that, you, you know, I'm learning from a marketing standpoint from, you know, negative words, keywords, you know, content, don't put links here, put videos here. So it's a, it, to answer your question, LinkedIn, but it's a learning curve on a daily basis, I would say. Love that, man. Okay. And have there been any particular lows or highs that you could share with us? Perhaps start with the lows, if we may, and how you've worked yeah. your way out of this. Yeah, I think there's, there's always going to be lows around stigma. You know, we always face stigma around being 24 and running a, a sales consultancy company. You know, the whole stigma around what do you know at 24? How can you possibly teach me um, how to build an industry leading sales team? And, you know, it, it got me down a lot. You know, don't get me wrong. You know, um, you kind of have that imposter syndrome feeling. You know, am I good enough? Was it luck? Has it been luck for the last 10 years? And um, it, it does get you low, you know, and the second part to that is it's a, it's a lonely journey. People don't realize when you start your own business, it's yourself and your business partner, you know, if you have one. Um, and yeah, you can, of course, you get help, but a lot of your time is spent alone uh, with your thoughts, with, um, you know, just yourself to talk to in a way. And uh, it's a lonely journey. So the two lows for me were, were initially that stigma that we faced. Um, and then the, the low part of, of being a sort of uh, entrepreneur, which I think everyone goes through. Um, so how do you, how do you keep positive in those kind of times, Kieran, when it is kind of, there's lots going on, perhaps you've just lost a big deal and you're, you're feeling quite, quite low and depressed perhaps. And you are like you say by yourself, especially in the pandemic that we're in now. So how do you stay, stay focused and on, on track? Yeah, I think it's about revisiting where you've come from for me. You know, you know, we talked about my story earlier. You know, I've gone from this child who's kind of nobody wanted to be around in terms of he was dumb, he was on, wasn't clever, he wasn't going to go anywhere. And, I, you know, I've achieved so much at a young age. And 
you know, I've got the, the proven track record and it's just about going back and realizing and uh, I guess a bit of gratitude around, you know, look, you know, things aren't all bad. Um, you, you know, you're always going to have them negative moments and negative things that happen, both the pandemic and, you know, losing deals and, and things like that. But it's about how you turn up and how you deal with them rather than what they are. Because I think if you crash an A, it's just going to keep happening. Um, so you really need to take check yourself. Um, there's, there's different ways you can do that. And we all, we all have different techniques. For me, um, it's going away and potentially um, reading a book, you know, just, just get my mind off that particular subject. Um, go into the gym uh, or going for a run, going for a walk, especially with weather like today. Um, or just calling a friend, you know, and saying, look, um, I had this situation. Um, what's your opinion? <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're kind of the, the like coping it. mechanisms I've I've found useful, but I'm sure there's different ones for different people depending on who you are. No, I like that, man. And what about talk us through a couple of the highs? Yeah, I mean, look, the highs have been of getting where we are today. You know, it, it's it's amazing for us to be 18 months in and achieve the 10 10 million in additional revenue. This is additional revenue. This isn't factoring their normal revenue. Uh, we've gone into spaces that I've never played in before. Uh, I'm really just proving the point that if you get your foundations right and you follow this four pillar process you will see amazing results in a short period of time. You know, we've seen clients have, you know, massive success in month one. Um, so for me, the high is to seeing the impact that it has on businesses. You know, I, one client that I have is a 13 year old business and they sort of um, procrastinated for years. They just couldn't get to that next level. Um, and within six months of being in there, you know, we've absolutely transformed that business. Uh, and for me, it's seeing the, the faces of the owners and the directors and really seeing their passion come back to their business um, through what we've done. Uh, and I love that, you know, it's not about the money for us. Um, the money, of course, is great and it's a byproduct. But for me, we get, we get a buzz off of seeing the impact that it has on businesses. And that's why we're so so motivated i guess you'd call obsessed with working with more and more businesses and that's why we want to get our message out you know we want to work with more businesses we want to um be part of their team and um and bring that success so the high for me is is one you know we we've done amazingly from a personal perspective to get the business off the ground with as you said 24 hours and not a lot of money um so sort of 10 million in additional revenue for our client 500,000 in revenue for ourselves uh as a business within 18 months um so yeah, they're the high. You know, sometimes you, you don't think about them. You kind of go, oh, I can do better. I'm not good enough. Come on, keep getting better. But sometimes you have to take check and say, look, you're 18 months in, give yourself a break. <laughs> good. Yeah, I agree. It's always good to time take take stock sometimes and reflect on, on the achievements you had, and especially when you're in lower times to remember those. And yeah, as we say, not not procrastinate. Good. So we've covered your, your four-step pillar process. But is there any, any other golden nuggets perhaps you could share with us, Kieran? For anyone tuning in that's thinking of starting their own company or anyone that's just taken the leap and started their own business, any other tips that you could share with them that might help them be a success? Yeah, from a business standpoint, for me, it's, it's go and just keep learning. Just never stop learning. You know, whether that be books, YouTube, courses, webinars, whatever that is, really go and find the people that know what you don't know. Um, and don't be afraid to admit that you don't know it, you know. Um, we can't all be experts at everything. So from a business standpoint, you know, that's my number one advice. Keep learning. Don't let yourself procrastinate um, and set yourself clear goals um, and just do it. You know, just do it. You know, I was fearful for it. You know, oh, should I do this? Should I take another job? Should I just go back to that comfy kind of paycheck? Um, just keep doing it. Keep turning up. You will have bad days. Um, it isn't all sunshine and, and roses, if you like. And um, you've just got to take check and, and keep uh, the end goal in sight. And for me, it's got to have a purpose. You, you can't just be about the money. Um, and work ethic, you know, something that I guess is a big subject right now is kind of that um, work-life balance. Um, for me, you know, I, I had two holidays in 10 years. Um, I worked 18 hour days for years. Um, yes, I get you need to have breaks, you need to work, uh, you need to spend time with your family, but there's no substitute for hard work. I don't care what anyone says. Um, I don't treat work and life as different things. When I need a break, I'll have a break. When I need a weekend off, I have a weekend off. But for me, it's going to take hard work. Um, you need to be obsessed with the journey, but also where you're going to um, and keep learning. They're my three nuggets from a business standpoint. From a sales standpoint, look, you know, it's, it's a tough industry. You, you need to make sure you're staying ahead of the curb because it's always changing. There's new tools. There's new competition. So keep learning. Keep learning. And as I said earlier in this call, um, go for the opportunity and not just a paycheck because paychecks are great short term, but they won't pay off long term because, you know, we're all early in our career and, you know, we've got years to go in terms of uh, our career. So um, 
my biggest advice from that side of things is look for opportunity, look for startups, um, look for people that are willing to give you the opportunity that necessarily the bigger companies won't. Um, and, and be, be in a position where you're willing to sacrifice things. You know, I know the biggest problem in today's society, and I'm guilty of it, you know, I've been guilty of it, of, you know, Rolexes, nice holidays, you know, oh, I wish I went there, I wish I could afford that. And, and actually, sometimes you've just got to realign your goals and say, well, look, am I willing to sacrifice um, this to get to here? And so that's my biggest advice from a sales perspective. Fantastic, man. Good stuff. And what is one thing that business should, businesses should be doing right now, Kieran, with digital marketing that's going to benefit them from today? Big, biggest thing is talk about what you do. Talk about you know your solution and the pain that you fix. You know, um, biggest biggest downfall that I've had is that I didn't talk. You know, I I, I kept away. I was shy. Uh, I know a lot of people are shy on LinkedIn. They don't want to put videos up. They don't want to put themselves out there. Just do it. Just do it. What's the worst can happen? You know, you will get people judge you regardless of whether you do it or not. So um, there's nothing to lose. So for me, it's about putting your story out there, but also um, educating people on the problem and the solution that you then solve. Um, for me get on that straight away, uh, whether it be LinkedIn, Instagram, wherever your audience are, um, start to really get your message out there. Amazing. Well, everyone, you've been tuning into Sam's Business Growth Show, where we sit down with business leaders, experts, and entrepreneurs from around the globe. We find out their story, how digital marketing has helped them away, and exclusive tips and insights to help you skyrocket your business. Kieran, if you could thank just one person, either dead or alive, for having a positive influence on yourself, your career, who would that be and why? <laughs> yeah, I guess it's, it's an interesting question for me because... As I said, in the young days, I didn't really have someone that, that was motivating. For me, there's, there's two key people, um, and, and they sound pretty weird when it comes to, to my journey, but biggest impact for me, and it's not someone I know personally, you know, uh, it's uh, ex-Man United football manager, Sir Alex Ferguson. He oh, wow, actually okay. had a massive impact uh, on me throughout my career. You know, I studied him well, how he manages his teams, where he came from, his journey, and, and he, he derailed a dynasty. you know, he, he achieved things that people said was never possible, and um, he's a living legend, and he's, you know, it's something that I admire on a daily basis, um, so although it's a weird answer, you know, he had a massive impact on me, you know, um, I still today watch his videos, his documentaries, his books, uh, I think the guy's incredible, and then for me, you know, my business partner, you know, Costa Coisy, who works alongside me on a daily basis, you know, I think um, he brings some amazing skill sets to the business, and um, I couldn't have done it without him, and I think what it allows me to do is go and do what I do best um, on, on a daily basis, and I think that's underestimated. Sometimes, you know, on press releases and things like that, you see my name, you see my, my face, but actually what people don't realize is what goes on in the background, you know, um, he's been a massive, uh, massive help for me, and uh, yeah, couldn't thank people enough. You know, it's, it's been amazing. I think too many people are quick to say it was themselves and don't realize that they need a team to support them in the background. Great choices, man. Just a shame that you're a Man United fan. So we'll wipe yeah, over that part. I'm not a Man United fan. Are you not? I'm, fan. Ah, okay. a, I'm a Bournemouth fan. Uh, ah, okay. Howie's a massive success. It wasn't about <laughs> Man United. It was about uh, who he was as a person and what Got he it. achieved, you know. Sure. Um, Just yeah, trying to pull your leg, man. It's, it's a, it's a, <laughs> I'm a cherry boy and I still remember beating Liverpool 4-3 on that amazing oh, day. Let's, let's um, not bring up yeah. beating Liverpool. <laughs> we'll uh, save that yeah. for another day. <laughs> but uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Kieran, thanks so much, man. It's been a really Thank enjoyable much, conversation. Man. Amazing. Thank Great you very to much for I appreciate it. Are you tired of constantly hunting for new customers? You could be missing out on regular inbound opportunities, all because your website isn't on the first page of Google. Perhaps you're already spending lots of money on advertising, but your website is failing to convert all of your hard-earned visitors into a consistent flow of new customers. If you'd like to learn more about our unusual approach that brings idle clients straight to you, Connect with Sam Dunning on LinkedIn or book a free 20 minute consultation via webchoiceuk.com. That's webchoiceuk.com. Subscribe today for more digital marketing, sales, and business growth tips from the experts.